For most, the pandemic may seem like it's over, but the man in charge of the White House COVID response team still has a job for now. With new variants bearing down on the U.S. this winter, Dr. Ashish Jha has a lot of different data to keep track of and to keep us safe. He's here now to discuss it all. Dr. Ashish Jha, thank you so much for joining us today. Anjali, thanks for having me here. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I kind of touched on it in the intro, but, you know, where are we in this pandemic? Are, are we done? Should we just wrap it up? You know, so COVID is around, COVID is still with us, and we still have lots of work to do. I mean, right? So first of all, if you take a step back, no question about it, we're in a much better place than where we were a year and a half ago when the president took office, we're better than where we were a year ago. Um, but we still have three to 400 Americans dying every day, still have tens of thousands of people getting infected every day. It's still quite disruptive. And so there is a lot of work to do to get this virus truly under control and to put it behind us. And beyond that, you also have what is what some are naming a twindemic, or if you include RSV, three pandemics essentially, or three concerning outbreaks at the same time. How are you coalescing around that in terms of whether or not you might advise for a return to certain stricter mitigation measures? Is that on the table for for this winter? Yeah. So you know, again, if you take that step back and think back to the fall and winter of 2020, right? We didn't have vaccines. We didn't have treatments. Uh, we barely had enough tests around. At that point, masking, social distancing, uh, shutting down large gatherings, that all made a lot more sense. I just don't think that's where we are as a country anymore. Um, right now, we do have widespread availability of these brand new uh, bivalent vac vaccines that are free, widely available. For pretty much everybody's eligible for it. We have treatments. We have lots of testing capability. In that context, Yes, I mean, obviously uh, we're looking at the flu, we're looking at and worried about uh, we might see with COVID or RSV, but I don't think we're gonna need to do anything that resembles what we had to do in, in previous winters. Um, I really do think we're in a very, very different place. Well, Dr. Josh, some would disagree with you saying that even though you, you do keep saying we have the tools, they may not be accessible or reachable for for everyone, right? There might be price barriers. Some people might have to budget whether or not they can buy so many tests. And the time uh, that it takes to, to get the, the COVID shots, we've already seen such a low uptake on these boosters. Are you concerned about that and about the messaging versus the reality? Yeah, so let's talk about that reality. It's a really good question, Anjali. So first of all, vaccines are free. Treatments are free. Tests are free for people who have any kind of insurance. If you have Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, by the way, that's about 90% of Americans can go get up to eight tests a month per member of the household for free. So just from a financial barrier, they are not substantial. Now, let me be very clear, there's still other challenges. These things are widely available vaccines in 70,000 spots. Basically, almost everybody lives within five miles of a place where you can get a vaccine or a treatment. So then the question is, what are the barriers? For some people, it's still hard to take time off. We've been working with employers, encouraging them to take time off. Uh, for other people, you know, if you're a mom, a single mom with three, you know, doing two or three jobs, it's going to be difficult. So we have been, we've done a lot of work to try to make childcare more accessible. There are still those challenges, but I do think for a vast majority of Americans, access and financial barriers are not what's slowing people down. What about indoor air quality? I know there was a recent summit to discuss that, and there's been a lot of attention from some advocates uh, about how to go about addressing that and the role that it plays in the spread of COVID. Uh, when you talk about not needing to bring back mitig mitigation measures, I think about indoors and what we really need to think about for this winter. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So let's take a minute to talk about that. You know, I have been a practicing clinician for 20 years. Um, I usually am in the hospital taking care of patients in December, January. The hospitals are always full pre-pandemic, uh, largely because of the flu. Throw in COVID on top of that, throw in potentially a significant RSV season, it's going to be very hard to manage our healthcare system if we don't make some important changes. And one of the things that we can do is to bring the burden of respiratory viruses way down for everybody and for all viruses and improving indoor air quality, better ventilation, better filtration. Many of these things, by the way, are really cheap to do. So you don't need to spend billions upgrading massive things. These are relatively cheap and easy interventions. They can make a substantial difference. I actually am convinced if people get their vaccines, if we make these improvements in indoor air quality that the government's been pushing and trying to help people do, uh, we really can get through a good fall and winter season this year and make it safer in the years ahead. Ashish, I have a very, very serious follow-up question for you. Looking at your job prospects, 
<laughs> we know that you came on board to help lead this response, but are you surprised that you're still in this role now? And, and do you see yourself returning to academia anytime soon? Well, it's, am I surprised that I'm still in this role? No. Like when I think about the work that we have to do every day, I get up early in the morning, I come into the office, we have long days. What are we trying to do? We're trying to help make sure that we have vaccines available for Americans and treatments and tests. We have to, we're tracking subvariants and making sure that Americans are protected against that. There is plenty for me and my team to do that no one has been thinking about. Boy, we're bored, we're running out of stuff, we gotta close up shop. That's not been part of our conversation. We are focused on doing the work ahead of us and none of us are thinking about kind of what happens after that. Well, I wanna follow up on that. I remember, you know, back in April, 2021, back when you were in your previous role, it was the day I was getting a vaccine and you were talking about um, the reports that have been coming about about the difference between who is opting for a vaccine and how it went along party lines and how that wasn't helpful. Now that you're in the hot seat, now that you're in the middle of all the politics, do you still stand by that? Do you, or, or has the job changed how you perceive or how you see how politicized everything is? Yeah, I still don't see this as a deeply political thing. I understand other people do that and political commentators see a political lens on almost everything. The way I look at it is a majority of people who voted for Donald Trump have gotten vaccinated. Majority of people who voted for Joe Biden have gotten vaccinated. Majority of Democrats, majority of Republicans, people are getting vaccinated. Um, more people need to go out and get vaccinated as we think about this fall and winter campaign. It is not helpful to look at how you manage a respiratory virus that's killed a million Americans. It is not helpful to look at that through a political lens. It is helpful to look at it through a medical and public health lens. And in that context, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you're going to benefit from these vaccines. You're going to get you're going to benefit from treatments. And that's my message. And that's what we try to do every day. And lastly, do you think that there are age limits or age parameters around who's really more in need of a vaccine than others? We've had some people say the older individuals or more vulnerable individuals really should get the vaccine and younger, healthy ones may be, may be able to pass. Yeah, I don't, I, the way I look at this, I don't look at it that way. The way I look at it is we know older people are at higher risk. By the way, older people are at higher risk for almost every condition. So that's not a new idea. A lot of people seem to have discovered that for COVID. That's also true for the flu, by the way. Um, what we know is that older people are gonna, they're at the highest risk, they're gonna benefit the most. Younger people are at lower risk, their benefit still outweighs their risk of getting vaccinated, which is why I've encouraged all my family to get vaccinated, all my friends to get vaccinated. Uh, my nieces and nephews and kids have all gotten vaccinated because for them, the benefit outweighs the risk. But no question about it, the biggest benefits are in older Americans. And if you're over 50, certainly if you're over 65, you've got to go get these vaccines because it's actually literally could save your life. It's a difference between life and death. Dr. Ashish, to your point, I, I think uh, a lot of people learned a lot of things about healthcare throughout this pandemic. But Dr. Ashish Jha, White House COVID-19 coordinator, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.